Here we go, see? I <laughs> got there in the end, made me trophy. Um, it is a much smaller heart than I was planning to do, but you know, it's small, it's neat, it's... The bottom bit's a bit wonky as well, but it's still cool to be able to print out a heart in your office, right? I printed out some lungs once from some MR data and forgot to kind of hollow it out. Wondering why it took so long. It printed out all of the MRI data so you could see the lungs, you could see the impressions of the ribs and stuff, and you could see the trachea and the main bronchi and stuff. But inside it, if you were to cut it in half, you'd have seen all the other structures. Crazy! Anyway, today, um, so we've been talking about the male and female reproductive systems and there's loads and loads and loads to talk about there. Uh, but last week, when we were talking about the male reproductive system, we touched on the bladder. And we talked about the prostate gland touching on the bladder and causing various things. So I thought, let's talk about the bladder. As part of the urinary system. And we'll talk about its innovation and micturition, that is urination. So um, not so much in a physiological sense, but from an anatomical perspective, you know, sympathetic nerves, parasympathetic nerves, visceral afferents, reflexes, high, and that sort of thing. Um, because the normal function of the bladder and its sphincters are very important to um, urinary continence, right? So if they go wrong, then there are issues. And when we're looking at the bladder, it has a special epithelium, and we should think about that epithelium, which can be damaged and give rise to the most common form of bladder cancer, which itself is a common form of cancer. It's certainly in the top 10. Okay, so our focus today is the bladder. And it sphincters is another bit. Okay, so here is the bladder. That's the easy bit. I think most of you know where the bladder is. Uh, this is the pubis bone. So we're in the pelvis here. Here's the pubis bone. And the pubis bone is the bony bit you can palpate. And as you're, if you look and see where the bladder is, posterior to the bladder is the rectum. Uh, this is a male pelvis, I can tell, because I can see the, the ductus deferens running around the bladder, so it must be a male pelvis. But nonetheless, the bladder within the pelvis doesn't have a huge amount of space to move around. It's anchored by some ligaments to the, to the pubis bone. Um, things, structures associated with the bladder tend to get called vesicle. Um, vesicle meaning a fluid-filled pouch, sac. Right. Anyway, I want to keep this brief and not go into all the nitty gritty and details about ligaments and stuff. Um, but the bladder then has the rectum beside it, behind it, posterior to it. Um, it's got the pubis bone anterior to it and it's got structures lateral to it. So when the, if the job of the bladder is to collect and store urine until it's convenient to get rid of that urine, then the bladder, as we know, stretches and expands. This bit up here is called the fundus, and the bladder expands superiorly, so it can, it, it's got room to move superiorly. Um, and then you can palpate a full bladder as it rises above the pubis bone, right? So that's the fundus up there. Now, the bladder does have a whole bunch of interesting things, and there's loads of lovely embryology I'd love to talk to you about, but we can save that for another time. If I open up the bladder and we look inside, we can see that much of the bladder is a muscular wall, and that muscle is the detrusor muscle. And we can see that the lining of the bladder, in this bladder, because it's empty of urine, it's not stretched, it's shrunk back down again, the lining of the bladder is folded. And the bladder is lined by an epithelium, and it gets called a transitional epithelium, or a uroepithelium. So this is a uroepithelium here. And uh, of course the reason it's folded, so we see these rougey, these folds, is that as the bladder expands, this means that while this special type of transitional epithelium, or this special type of urethelium, is, has evolved to stretch as the layers in the cells move and it's it's a stretchable epithelium basically but it means that those folds mean that it's even easier to stretch that layer right that's why the folds are there um, and you can see a smooth patch here right and can you see that that smooth patch has two openings either side and those openings are for the ureters which are coming down here so the ureters enter into the bladder laterally on either side. These are the ureteric openings then. And inferiorly, you see there, there's the urethra. 
descending from the bladder. And we have this smooth triangular shape of urethelium between the ureteric openings and the urethral opening. And that's called the trigone. And that's a relatively fixed area of the bladder. Um, it doesn't stretch very much. Um, and those are where those structures, those things come in and out, are fairly fixed positions. But everything else stretches around it. So that's the trigone. Um, now the urethelium is susceptible to uh, developing carcinomas um, and that would be a transitional cell carcinoma or a urethelial cell carcinoma um, and um, you know uh, once they start to develop um, they can erode the lining of the bladder which will then cause blood vessels to leak so the first sign is usually blood in the urine which means it can be picked up early which means it can be treated early, which means that it's not a massive killer. Um, there's, there's quite a good survival rate from bladder cancer, but if left untreated, it can invade into the muscle and, and, and spread and so on, which is not so good. Um, but of course, if you, if you do find a urethelial cell carcinoma, then it doesn't mean it's definitely come from the bladder because the urethelial epithelium, the urethelial cells also line the ureter and also line the urine collecting systems within the kidney so those calyces the minor calyces the main, major calyces and the renal pelvis you could develop a urethelial cell carcinoma at any of those locations so don't forget that watch out for that um, go back and have a look at the kidney video if you want a refresher on the kidney now the i think one of the reasons why bladder cancer is um, reasonably common is that the urethelium is of course in contact with urine um, all the time most of the time depending on how the bladder is filled and of course while the urethelium is kind of specialized to cope with that um, we know that smoking cigarettes increases the risk of bladder cancer. And I think working in certain industries, like in the rubber industry and what have you, also increases the risk of bladder cancer. So what this means is that the chemicals that are taken in by the body and are then passed out in the urine, of course, collect in the bladder and sit there in the bladder and damage the cells of the urethelium, leading to bladder cancer, all right? And the other thing, ooh, and the other thing to think about, uh, particularly I think when we were talking about the female reproductive system was how um, these pelvic viscera are covered by the peritoneum. Do you remember my amazing demonstration with cling film which didn't really work that well. Cling film is difficult stuff to work with. Um, so that the top of the bladder, the fundus of the bladder is covered with, with peritoneum. Anywho, um, the other interesting thing about the detrusor muscle and the ureteric openings is that um, when the detrusor muscle contracts, it's going to compress those ureteric openings. So when the function then of the detrusor muscle is to contract and squeeze urine out of the bladder during voiding, when it squeezes, it closes off the ureters so that it doesn't send urine back up to the kidneys, although that can happen in some uh, pathological um, processes. Um, right, okay. When talking about the pelvis, we of course need to consider two pelvises, the male pelvis and the female pelvis, and there are some differences. Uh, when we talked about the male reproductive system, we talked about the internal urethral sphincter in uh, the bottom of the male bladder, right? So there's a, there's a proper internal urethral sphincter um, in the male bladder, whereas the female bladder kind of has this physiological internal urethral sphincter, it's kind of a thing, kind of not a thing, kind of meh. Um, and the reason for that is that, of course, um, if you have an internal urethral sphincter where the urethra leaves the bladder, then during ejaculation, you close off that internal urethral sphincter to stop semen going up into the bladder to make sure it goes out through the penis, right? Um, whereas the female bladder doesn't really need that. The detrusor muscle is, it has autonomic innovation, all right? Um, the internal urethral sphincter 
also has autonomic innovation. But the external urethral sphincter, which is at the level of the uh, levator ani muscle, at the level of the pelvic floor, where you have a bunch of other somatic muscles, the external urethral sphincter is a somatic muscle under somatic control. So you can hold on to that to stop urine coming out, right? Um, so you, 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 there's a whole bunch of interesting nervous stuff going on here. If you think about children, there are some reflexes, right? Um, and it makes sense that the, the wall of the bladder has a bunch of stretch receptors in it. So the bladder fills with urine and the bladder knows when it's feeling, when it's becoming full, and you, you perceive your bladder as, well, my bladder's full. Um, but of course, that sensation kind of comes and goes, doesn't it? Until it gets really full, in which case you got to go. Um, but the bladder then senses it's stretching, it's filling, and there's a reflex back to the spinal cord such that um, the bladder fills, the reflex goes back to the spinal cord, and then, so that's, those are visceral afferent fibers carrying that sensory innovation back, and then um, parasympathetic fibers run from the spinal cord, and because we're in the pelvis, those are coming from the sacral levels, from S2, S3, and S4, because we're low down. Those parasympathetic fibers um, cause the detrusor muscle to contract and push urine out, right? Um, there is sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation of the detrusor muscle, but parasympathetic innervation causes micturition, right? But of course, you've got a sphincter there, that external urethral sphincter, um, sympathetic innervation will close it. Now you can remember this if you think about the male pelvis. Um, erection is caused by parasympathetic innervation and um, emission and ejaculation are largely controlled by sympathetic innervation, right? Uh, P and S. Some of my students tell me they remember it by thinking of point and shoot, but that's entirely up to you. Um, so the sympathetic innervation during ejaculation closes off that internal urethral sphincter. So for micturition, to get urine out of the bladder, you have parasympathetic innervation causing the bladder to contract, and then you have to release that sympathetic innervation on the sphincter, right? So the parasympathetic innervation will, will act against the sympathetic innervation it'll cause the internal urethral sphincter to relax and urine can pass out into the urethra and then it's up to you to relax your external urethral sphincter and allow the urine to pass out. And if we think about children, of course, when they're very, very young, they have this, this reflex, bladder fills, bladder voids, bladder fills, bladder voids. It's just, it's a reflexive thing. And as they get older, the higher centers in their brain develop and their brain changes and they can sleep through the night uh, without needing without wetting the bed um, or getting up in the night, they can go to the toilet. You know what I mean? They have, you develop higher levels of control over those spinal cord reflexes. And what happens then as an adult is that, of course, your bladder may be full or semi-full and you, you kind of feel the need to go to the toilet when it's convenient for you to do so. When it's really full, your body says, you gotta go now. But most of the time, you've got these higher functions acting on these lower functions and all this kind of autonomic and stuff going on. You know, and if you really have to, you can really hold it because you have that somatic control from the pedental nerve over the external urethral sphincter. While we're talking about the urethra, the male urethra is very long because there's a penis. Um, whereas the female urethra is very short. This means that the female bladder um, and the female urinary system is much more prone, much more likely to get urinary tract infections. Okay, that's why that occurs. Now there's another interesting thing to think about if you're thinking about reflexes. Um, there's a thing called the guarding reflex, which I quite like. Uh, so, you have urine in your bladder most of the time. Occasionally you cough, you sneeze, you laugh, you increase your um, intra-abdominal pressure, intra you increase the pressure that's being applied to your bladder. There's a risk then that you could push urine out through your urethra. So what happens is that that, that, that pressure is detected 
and um, the, the reflex, it causes those um, urethral sphincters to close to prevent any leakage of urine. You can imagine that if that breaks down, then you can get uh, urinary stress incontinence, stress urinary incontinence, whatever it's called, one of those, right? So the guarding reflex. Okay, so we've talked about the bladder, we've talked about the urethelium, we've talked about the detrusor muscle, the urethra, the ureters briefly as well. Here's another thing to think about. If the parasympathetic innervation to the bladder is coming from the sacral spinal cord down here, and the sympathetic innervation to the sphincters in the bladder is of course coming essentially from the thoracic spinal cord, because that's where all the sympathetic nerves come from. Um, and the somatic innervation is also coming from the, the sacral spinal cord. What happens in a spinal cord injury to control of micturition? Is it, is it completely lost? Do we have that filling and voiding reflex? Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And of course, it's gonna, de it's gonna vary depending upon the level of the spinal cord injury. But if you imagine that there's an injury at the lumbar level and um, the sacral spinal cord reflexes are intact, but their connection to the higher centers has been removed because the spinal cord has been severed at a lumbar region, but the sympathetic nerves are still getting to um, the bladder because they're passing from the thoracic spinal cord through the body, through those splanchnic nerves and um, hypogastric plexuses and what have you. Then what happens? Well, shortly after the spinal cord injury, um, things are a bit strange anyway, but, uh, and things change over time. But if you consider some months after a spinal cord injury when um, the system, systems have settled down a little bit, um, it all gets a little bit strange. So the bladder senses that it's filling with urine and um, it then starts off that reflex to trigger voiding of the bladder and con contraction of the, the detrusor muscle. But as the detrusor muscle contracts, the increase in pressure then triggers the guarding reflex. Well, certainly it can do. And of course the guarding reflex is going to cause the closing of those urethral sphincters. So the bladder is trying to contract and push urine out, but the sphincters are closing and preventing urine from being pushed out. Now those the, um, the smaller sphincter muscles are going to tire uh, and that'll le allow some urine out and then they'll, they'll close up again. And of course there's going to be some natural tone in the background which allows the bladder to fill and things like that. And it will vary from person to person and it will vary from patient to patient. Um, but of course if you have that situation then there's a risk of backflow of urine up the ureters and up into the, the urine collecting spaces of the kidneys leading to hydronephrosis, you know, swelling of of the kidneys, which would be bad. Which, so, you know, you can treat this by um, catheterization or, um, and there are, there are a number of other methods, but my point is the innovation of the bladder and the musculature of the bladder and the sphincters is important, but a little complex. And when it breaks down, it leads to urinary incontinence, which is an issue. Um, and if you think about spinal cord patients and you, you look at the variety of things that happens, it, hones your thinking about about how the, the how micturition works. Okay, so there you go. There's a little bit more about the urinary system and we've linked it to the the uh, the pelvis anatomy we're looking at as well. I hope that was useful. So much more to talk about. Right, okay.